Kent Roach, thank you so much for joining us. Are you? We're Very having welcome. this discussion as part of the International Conference on Shaping and Interpreting Transformative Constitutions. Now, internally in Kenya, we have been grappling with how to best implement our constitution. We've been fighting for this constitution for over 20 years. So now we have a new constitution. Of course, citizens have expectations. Um, so a lot of people are litigating before the courts. Um, but there's this issue of constitutional remedies. What is the court actually going to grant? And um, what remedies would a citizen feel would be granted that a citizen would feel that you know, my, my rights have been vindicated and I have gotten the appropriate remedy from the court. Well, I mean, remedies are, are really crucial to making rights real for people. And I think that Kenya is fortunate that its constitution guarantees at least the jurisdiction of the high court to award remedies. Although we've heard in the conference that there may be some problems getting remedies from magistrates and statutory courts. But there'll, there'll be a whole range of remedies. It really depends upon the rights. If, it's, uh, if a police officer has acted improperly uh, in the criminal process, then there might be exclusion of evidence or stay of proceedings. Sometimes the constitutional remedies are, from, uh, are, are given to unpopular people. Th but there's other cases, like cases of forced eviction, where people will try to come to the court and uh, basically keep the, keep try to keep their homes at least for as long as they can. So remedies are, are really crucial, but they're some of the very most difficult issues that the courts confront. Um, what are the main remedies that you think would be appropriate in situations where there's been a long-term violation of rights, where there's a systemic failure of organs of government. What, what kind of remedies do you think would be the best? Right. Well, the traditional choice is between a declaration, which is when a court says someone's rights have been violated, and they may say just a little bit about what the right entails. So a choice between a declaration and an injunction. And an injunction is a mandatory court order where the court says, you must do this, and if you do not do this, we, we may punish you. We may punish the government, we may punish the minister, or, or the person that the order is directed towards. And, you know, it's a little bit like uh, the um, um, uh, fairy tales that I used to tell my daughters, because uh, declarations may be too soft, and injunctions may be too hard. And so, one of the things that I was talking about at the conference is, can you have something in the middle that I call a declaration plus? And what a Declaration Plus would do is it would tell the government that they violated someone's constitutional rights. It would give the government some general idea of what they had to do to comply in the future, but the court would retain jurisdiction and perhaps ask the government to report back to them about what they were going to do. And then the court may further adjudicate whether what is proposed is within the the parameters of what is constitutional. And I, I, I you know that's a remedy that I think may be attractive because an injunction is a very hard remedy and because someone could eventually go to jail uh, th there may be a role for that but the court has to be very specific about what they want. And sometimes it is I think a good idea to allow some room for governments to decide what to do, but also to consult with the people who are most directly affected. Uh, so it really depends on the circumstances. Declarations, injunctions, and as I say, the Declaration Plus, which sits somewhere between a, a soft declaration and a harder injunction. I, I guess that's more inclined towards dialogue which is which is an interesting take to normal judicial yes. procedures yes. in that you're introducing almost an, a dialogue framework within the context of a, a normal court case um, because there has been quite a bit of tension between the different arms of government um, with um, the legislature and the executive um, feeling attacked almost um, 
because of ju uh, judicial de decisions that are implicating on their mandate. And um, they're actually complaining that judiciary is stopping them from actually executing their mandate. So that's actually a good point. What are the key lessons that you think um, we should be learning from the Canadian experience, perhaps, when it comes to issues of economic, social, and cultural rights, because that's a very fundamental issue right now with the Wanjiko, which is our, <laughs> our you know, phrase for a common citizen. That's right. No. Well, I mean, I think when you're talking about social and economic rights, dialogue is actually a, a necessity. And, and you see this in the South African Constitution, where the South African courts either reach out to the legislature or the executives or to the people through engagement. Because, I mean, the, the hard fact of it is that the judges are not going to go out and stand in front of the bulldozer. The judges are not going to be able to deliver health care for people that need it. So the only way the judges can persuade uh, people to do that is by prodding the executive and the legislature. So I think that, you know, once you're out of kind of a traditional right where the judge can do the remedy simply by him or herself, you're really talking about judge and company. Judge and the executive, judge and the legislature, judge and the people, uh, judge and even the media. So. I think that that dialogue is, is it's hard, it doesn't always work, but I do think it is a reality. In terms of the Canadian experience, I mean, I, I think the Canadian experience is mixed. Uh, we had one case where our Supreme Court remained seized of a matter for seven years to make sure that the legislature was doing something that it had historically not done, which was to translate the laws into French because we have constitutional uh, obligations of bilingualism. So that's, that's, that's one model. But there's also been some failures in Canada. Some Sometimes judges have issued soft declarations and the problems have continued and sometimes continued litigation is necessary. So if you have a transfer transformative constitution, Rome's not built in a day. It's going to take a while and uh, you know the, 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 the end of the court case is often just the beginning for the fight for social justice. And so I think that we have to uh, you know uh, um, not be complacent uh, but also not despair and just kind of keep on going and realize that the problems that the courts are dealing with in my society, and I suspect in yours, are fundamental. They've been around for a long time. Not everything's going to work, but we need to be open and we need to admit when something's not, not working. Um, I have just one final question, and it relates to um, the issues of complementarity between the national judicial system and regional mm, yes. <laughs> judicial yes. mechanisms. Yes. And what is the Canadian experience with that? Yeah. Um, in how Canada relates with um, decisions that have been made against it by the European Court? Because in Kenya we have situations, uh, and often it's the norm, yes. that decisions are made against Kenya that are consistent with our constitution and our obligations under the treaties under those mechanisms but yet there isn't a framework for enforcement um, of those decisions there's not a framework of implementation um, of those judgments so what is it that we can learn from Canada's experience? Mm, yeah no I mean I mean I think it's an interesting question because when I talk about dialogic remedies although I'm mainly talking about remedies at domestic law they're actually somewhat similar to the remedies that regional and international bodies give. And, you know, sometimes they don't work, right? So the typical remedy that an international human rights body or a regional human rights body would, would give is we find that you violated someone's rights, we publicize that, we describe the story, and then we basically ask the, the state what are they going to do to, re to repair uh, the violation. So it's a fairly deferential process when it comes to international and regional law. I think that domestic law should be a l little bit tougher, but I think the common element in all of this is that the court cannot do 
all of the work itself. And you have to have a very vigilant civil society and media that demands that the government lives up to it. So Canada has also had some adverse international decisions. And the government is only going to pay attention to that to the extent that voters and the media basically shames the government into complying. Uh, much of our international record has to deal with our indigenous people who we've treated very poorly. Uh, there's kind of colonization within Canada. And so it's a combination of working on the domestic front in court and also outside of court, but also going to the international uh, mechanisms when the domestic mechanisms fail. So there's really no end point where you could say, you know, Eureka, we've transformed. Uh, no society is ever going to be completely just. And so I think that you just have to be vigilant and strategic and keep trying at all, in all of these different forums, international, regional, the legislature, the court, the Human Rights Com Commission, and, and, and so on. So it's, it's tough and it's endless business but it's very important business.